much for inviting me. I appreciate this opportunity and um, I'll try to make this a little shorter because I know you guys are running a little bit late. Uh, I'm very honored to be named the distinguished speaker for 2023, 2024. And it was a little bit challenging to figure out a time in everyone's schedules that I could come to the UK and uh, present some of this stuff. Uh, but it looks like it's set now. I'm coming the first week of May. I believe May 7th, I'm in Bristol. May 8th, I'm in Edinburgh. We're trying to work out Glasgow still. And May 10th, I believe I'm in uh, London. So I'll make a whirlwind tour in the first week of May before some of you guys go into finals. And uh, I'm sure everyone will be uh, alerted to those meetings and they get finalized. All right, um, so let me quickly uh, go to my presentation here. I will do this version of this at uh, my live presentations in May when I get there. But uh, for those who will not have the opportunity to do this, uh, this is my chance to do it for all of you. And also, um, I will probably do a slightly different version by the time I get there in May anyway. So it will still be worth hearing twice if you are able to do so. All right, so um, what I... Thought I present here is something I have uh, been working on off and on now since about 2007. Um, it started out actually as something that was uh, uh, sort of a demand when I was teaching at Occidental College in Los Angeles, which is a small liberal arts uh, college with no graduate program. Everybody is basically uh, undergrads, but we do a lot of research. And I was always pretty much giving my undergrads the opportunity to do publishable research as undergrads, as we do not have a grad program. And I was thinking hard of how to give them uh, access to uh, research and publication uh, and not have to do all the heavy lifting all the time because it's a big steep learning curve to learn fossil vertebrate anatomy and all the rest. And then I realized La Brea Tar Pits is practically my backyard. It's only 20 miles from where I live and traffic in LA, that's an hour drive. Um, but the uh, uh, challenge was you know, finding a way to make that work. And so I made contacts with them and then introduced each of my students, uh, some of my Occidental students, and then my Caltech students, and then some students eventually from Cal Poly, where I now teach. Uh, you know, I get bring them the first time and have them meet the right people and make arrangements so they're known there, and then they could go in at their leisure and do the rest of the work. And you'll see the kind of work they did in just a second here. So that's why I have so many co-authors on this title slide. Uh, they're all former students uh, who published one man, uh, particular animal in this large-scale, uh, long-term project. And I'll summarize what they've all been working on ever since then. So um, we'll be talking about the idea of punctuate equilibrium. Uh, uh, first proposed in 1972, so it's now 51 years since that famous paper came out. And for those of you not familiar, I know the younger generation may or may not hear about this very much in their introductory classes. Uh, at the time it came out, it was a sort of revolutionary idea. I was just entering college at the time it came out. And so I wasn't fully aware of its implications until I got into graduate school. But at that point, it was just starting. And um, it was an interesting sort of thing because Niles and Steve were both recent graduates of the American Museum of Natural History in New York and the Columbia University program, of which I'm also a product. And um, Niles was actually one of my mentors and I took classes from him. Um, they had come out of the program themselves having uh, sort of uh, looked for projects uh, under Norman Newell, a famous bi-bot paleontologist who was the curator there for many years. And one of the things that struck them when they were looking for projects is how they were looking for evolution in their fossils. Niles especially looking at trilobites like Ficopa trilobites and not seeing much change through time. And then both Steve and Niles sort of came up with the insight that if you look at the ideas of the biologists like Ernst Meyer from 30 years earlier, the allopatric speciation model had long ago predicted that species would be uh, pretty much evolving very rapidly. New species form in uh, time frames of thousands, maybe tens of thousands of years is the longest, maybe much shorter. And you would never be able to see that in most quality fossil records. Um, and so you would actually see when the geologic record, unless you have an extraordinarily detailed one, you would see a sudden appearance of a new species. And then the issue would be what happens after the species forms. But you would not see gradual change. It's something Darwin, of course, had given everyone the task of finding ever since the origin came out in 1859. And so this was something, uh, ironically, paleontologists, once again, were sort of behind the ball to a new generation of young Turks like Elbridge and Gould to recognize that basically biologists have been telling us we'd looked at the fossil record the wrong way at the long time because our understanding of timescales is often uh, disjunct with the way the biologists see timescales. So it really was by, by basically modern biological speciation theory, which they dated back 30 years earlier, finally being applied to the fossil record. And there's Niles in more recent years. 
And there's one of the photos of me on the right there and Steve on the left, and that's Michael Shermer. Skeptics aside, in the middle, we were up at the Mount Wilson Telescope, which is about Pasadena, not far from here, uh, when Steve was here in the US uh, giving a, a lecture tour. Uh, this is one of the more famous versions of this uh, sort of idea. On the uh, right, uh, excuse me, on the left, you see the idea of gradual change through time. So what we're looking at is at the bottom, they say a histogram of some characteristic of an animal or plant uh, at time frame one. And then each time frame, that histogram shifts gradually a little bit, in this case, to the right. And then maybe you have a splitting event at some point, and then you still gradually change into two divergent groups. But what uh, uh, Gould and Elger said is that you shouldn't expect that on the time resolution of most fossil sequences. You're looking at thousands of years of maybe more between bedding planes. So this kind of thing is too fast for us to see in the fossil record, except in rare instances. Instead, over the million year time frames we're used to dealing with, you would see more or less uh, stability, as you see in the left or the right diagram, the left column, uh, where it may be wobble around a mean for a while, but it's always going to stay more or less in the same place, except when you get a speciation event, like you see in the uh, right there. Um, I don't know if my pointer will show, but right here is our speciation event. And then it will form a new species, and the two species will branch, and they will live side by side. So this idea was just emerging as I got into college and I sort of was exposed to it at undergrad, but it really was until I got to the American Museum and Natural History and Columbia University in New York in 1976 at my first year of grad school that it was more apparent how this was gonna work. And so um, just to quickly jump ahead 50 years, uh, a year ago, we hosted a symposium in uh, Denver, Colorado in 2022 on the 50th anniversary of this paper, uh, which came out, uh, and, and this, if I remember this vividly, because all my early years in grad school, every uh, Geological Society of America meeting we went to and the North American Paleo Conventions we went to, this was one of the hottest topics for a decade after it came out and still um, gen generating interest today. So we had a 50th anniversary celebration in, 19, in 2022. There's Niles there, he's still going strong, still pretty Pretty uh, 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 striver guy in his 80s, giving his uh, keynote talk, and myself and Trish Kelly there as moderators. Uh, and it's now in the editing processes. It will surely come out a special volume of paleobiology in 2025. So those you get Americans uh, Paleo Society's paleobiology, you'll see it. So let's go back to the ideas then. Um, so when you talk to a biologist, uh, what we call disparagingly neontologist. Uh, they think of organisms, if you talk to them, especially if they deal with evolution, as infinitely flexible, rapidly responsive to environmental change. Um, and of course, they almost always, and our textbooks are full of these examples from the peppered moths to fruit flies to Galapagos finches. To, now, different experimental animals have been used at different times, but the idea is that they're seeing change in relatively short framework. Okay, and so for example, you know, the classic example is the Galapagos finch, which has now been studied by uh, Peter and members of Grant and many other people for great deals of time. We know a lot about how they evolve pretty much year to year, uh, especially after major events like uh, drought events in the Galapagos or whatever, and uh, you know, striking things happen to their beaks and their body size and so on. And so this has become sort of the uh, classic case of how evolution should occur. And it's uh, touted to our students and put in our textbooks routinely along with numerous other examples. Now we have a giant clash between that and what you and I as paleontologists understand, which is that we look at fossil records over a million year time scales. We can't see a year duration or 10 year duration except in rare cases. And what we have always known is that it's st stability is the norm that change is rare in our fossil record. Um, gradual change is especially rare. And in the decades since that paper came out, a lot of examples of gradualism were put forward. And in a famous uh, 1977 paper, Niles and Steve wrote, they debunked just about every one of them. Um, there really aren't that many good, well-established cases of gradual evolution that are you know, statistically robust and occur in enough different regions. Those are all sorts of the pitfalls that people had not taken into account. Stasis is the rule. Gradual change is the exception. There are just a handful of uh, still strong examples within metazoans. Um, of course, I once worked on microplankton and radiolaria, especially. They are very different, but then they don't follow the allopatric speciation model because they're not mostly sexual most of the time. All right, so what kind of mechanisms would explain the stability? Is it something biological inherent to the organism? Is it something environmental? Um, the, 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 certainly the finches are response to the environment, but as we'll see in a moment, doesn't happen that often. So the big surprise then 
is that stasis is the norm and pretty much found in most all metazoans. Uh, Steve famously coined the taste phrase, stasis is data. Uh, because, you know, basically since the days of William Smith, you know, now 200 plus years ago, we knew the fossils pretty much didn't change through thousands of years and millions of years of strata. Okay. And that the stability of fossils and their, their you know, ability to be used tells, uh, gave us biostatography in the first place. If they changed gradually all the time, biostatography wouldn't work so well. I remember my undergrad professors in the early 70s were arguing about this and how you define uh, breaks in a species that gradually change. Well, it turned out to be a non-problem because haven't needed to worry about that since William Smith. Okay. Um, so we see all sorts of neontological attempts to explain it. Uh, you know, stabilizing selection has been proposed, but these things are not stable uh, environments. So I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and then by the end of this cycle of about 40, 50 years of talking about it in 92, and then 2001, Ernst Meyer published two papers where he finally conceded that the long-term stability of species over the inner time scales was a mystery. He did not think we had fully understood. So even Meyer himself recognized that we are still on the learning curve here. All right, let me jump to my particular example. Um, and I will start with one of your uh, compatriots, uh, Hugh Faulkner, one of the leading vertebrate paleontologists in Darwin's generation, who sadly died in his 50s. Uh, but he was well acquainted with a lot of Pleistocene mammals, especially mammoths and the mastodons, mostly mammoths where you are. Uh, and he told Darwin that when he looked at Ice Age mammal, uh, mammoths that showed up in different parts of the glacial and interglacial cycles or just then being documented in the UK, they always looked the same. There was no obvious change between one glacial cycle and the next. And so already, even though that was a very crude example for its time, it wasn't that much. It was enough that Falconer saying he doesn't see change, even though there was climate change going on and glacial interglacial intervals happening. So it's not exactly a new discovery, but it's not been documented as much uh, until recent years. Now, of course, we have excellent records of Ice Age mammals in many places. Uh, North America has a lot of records of them in caves and in many other things. And we're, you know, getting so we understand this pretty well. My good friend, Tony Bernowski, who retired from Berkeley a few years ago, uh, just a couple of quotes from his work, climate oscillations, the multi-millennial scale may not stimulate speciation much. And from another paper, empirically that it suggests speciation rates are not appreciably elevated for returning mammals, nor strongly uh, correlated with glacial interglacial transitions. Uh, and then it's been done at the community level well. So is the ice ages are less notorious for actually most animals go through glacial and underglacial cycles without anything we can observe in the way of change. Um, so, as I said, back in 2007, I was trying to find a place where I could uh, get my students to do research and do most of the work themselves rather than me doing all the work. And I realized the bread tarpets is perfect. There's a great opportunity for them. They could, once I connected them there, they could do their research. And it's legendary. Three million bones at the moment are collected and uh, plant fossils as well, but mostly bones uh, and insect fossils as well. Uh, the pits themselves, some of them have tens of thousands of bones in them. So the sample sizes of certain animals are huge. And we have them all the way from about 35,000 years ago. Actually, there's some pits that date to 40K, although they don't have very much in them, to early Holocene, 7,000 years ago. Uh, and radiocarbon dating was done on them back in the 60s and been redone and redone. And we get newer dates all the time. So I have a new paper coming out for this special volume of paleobiology where we're going to put the new dates in. But this data from the last cycle of dates I was able to uh, incorporate. And um, I know you guys aren't used to Hollywood looking like this, but this is what Hollywood look like in the Pleistocene, late Pleistocene. OK, no movie stars, no Hollywood sign on the hills, which look the same. Instead, as you can see, it's also my background and my thing if you can see that it's Rome it had a lot of mammals roaming across it from big things like mammoths and mastodons to bison horse and camels all of which were North American natives horses and camels lived here most of their history uh, and a variety of other things as well three different species of ground sloths and tapirs and peccaries and of course a huge number of predators uh, well, dire wolves is the most common but also uh, saber-toothed cats and giant lions and a bunch of other things and so these tar seeps come up on the ground and most of the time, especially because we have drought most of the year, uh, they're just dry areas with a little bit of tar in the ground. And so they're not obvious uh, hazards. 
uh, now, when we get our rare rains, like I'm getting rain today, which is really rare for Southern California. We don't haven't had any months of rain and we're getting it finally. Um, it'll form a pool of water, which is enticing to the animals, but you know, it doesn't take much. Now you step into that tar and you sink in. And if you don't move fast enough, you will be trapped. Uh, and you don't need to trap an animal every day to make this happen. Even with 3 million bones, it's estimated we only need to trap an animal once a century to get the detail and the amount of uh, collections we have. So it's uh, considered to be a predator death trap. One predator uh, or two, uh, will be attracted by a struggling prey animal like a horse or a camel or a bison, and then others follow. And so we end up with way, way more predators than we end up with prey, a reverse of the normal type of relationship. Uh, today, of course, doesn't look like that anymore. This is the front entrance to the museum, which used to be the George Page Museum. They just took, call it the La Brea Tar Pits Museum. This big pit in front is called the Lake Pit. It was not actually a fossil pit. It was a, a asphalt excavation pit where they took asphalt out for tar roofs and for axles in the colonial days. And then uh, eventually, of course, it filled in with water. And so it's got water in it all the time now. But there are bubbles of methane on the surface. If you watch it live, live, you'll see bubbling methane coming up all the time. We have methane coming up underground in this whole area because it's a giant oil field beneath it. And all the time, they've had examples of where buildings blew up because the basins were filled with methane and got ignited. So it's actually a very risky thing. They all have a methane detectors and ventilation now so this don't happen. Out in that pond is a... Uh, Three, a threesome of imperial mammoths, um, the Columbia mammoths is not what we call them now, and they're made of fiberglass, so the one out in the lake sort of floats, and they're out there all the time to keep the tourists happy. Uh, when you go there today, it's pretty much dried up. I mean, there'd be water seeping in now and then, but mostly just tar in the bottom, and the bones are a huge jumble. There's no association of any two bones with any other, so we don't know which one belonged to whom. The only associated skeleton we've ever found came in a the excavation was done about 10 years ago when the bulldozer actually scraped the top off the head of a, um, a Colombian mammoth. They know him, know him as Zed now, and he's about an 80% complete skeleton. He was at the very top of a brand new excavation that was called Project 23, where they're putting a parking lot in for the adjacent art museum and they hit the, another tar pit. So they had to do a quick job of salvage paleo to get it out. But this is pit 91, which is the one I worked on when I was a 10th grader in 1970. Uh, I was a very high school even volunteer. I couldn't even drive yet, so I took the bus down there. Four hours round trip. Buses are slow in L.A. And um, got my experience. First time I ever did anything really paleo related in my career. So again, uh, it breaks down into herbivores. Uh, bison is most one of the most common, along with camels, horses, and three kinds of ground sloths. The biggest is paramyelin and harlanai. Pronghorns, deer, mammoths, mastodons, and a variety of small mammals, although they're not as uh, abundantly collected, but way outweighed by the number of predators. Uh, Smilodon and the, the, the wolf, Canis, well, it used to be Canis dyrus, now Enocyanodyrus. Uh, the big lion, Panthera atrox. Uh, the big short-faced bear, Arctodocemus. And surprisingly, what people don't realize, because he doesn't even show up in those dioramas, how many birds we have. There's 139 different species of birds documented from Rancho La Brea, of which uh, about a third are extinct species and the rest are living ones. And I'll show you why that's important in a moment here. Now, just to give you a sense of what we're working with here, I don't know if you've seen collections like this before, but if you ever get to LA, make a point of coming to the Brea Tar Pits. And you can actually see this in the public area, although it helps to have access to the back area. Right? Uh, the, the museum I showed you in the previous diagram has sort of a sloping Mesoamerican pyramid shape. And the slopes, which the kids like to roll down the grassy slopes on, are not there just for shape. They actually hide a series of galleries of collections that are not public access. Uh, and there's only one window where anyone in the public can actually see it. And this is just typical of these collections. You pull out a drawer. This is on the left here, Tarsomatotarsus and the main leg bone of the golden eagle, which is the most common bird there, believe it or not. In America, you see one golden eagle in a, a, a month, you're lucky. There are just hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, and then this is in the center there is ankle bones of Stragoli of Smilodon, this uh, saber tooth, and then middle toe bone, middle, middle tarsal three of Smilodon, lower right. Drawer after drawer after drawer, just like this. All beautifully laid out. The curators did an amazing job of laying all the bones out in nice little rows. And, and then for the ones that are in the mammal collection, all separated by pit. So you can just look at the label in the drawer and know which pit you're in and how old the collection is. And the rate of carbon dating is undergoing some revision. This is an older diagram, but you can see there's a general trend. 
The youngest pit is Holocene, which is pit 10, which is about 9,000 years old. Uh, pit 67, 67 is late uh, Pleistocene. Uh, very good dates on pit 3 and pit 13. We use those a lot. Uh, pit 60 now and then. Uh, pit 77 is the oldest one, which we get good dates on. It's mostly around 35K. Uh, a lot of others, like pits uh, 16, uh, has really scattered dates, so we don't use it at all. Um, and that's pit 16 right there. Uh, so unfortunately, most of the birds come from pit 16. So when you're measuring the collection, you have to first check their pit origin before you measure them because otherwise you can't use those data. Now, these are all undergoing revision right now. There's a lot of new dates coming in and the paper that uh, Val Cypress and I will publish in this paleobiology special issue will talk about the way in which we rethought the dating of this, but it's more or less the same conclusion. So as I mentioned, um, it's a really good opportunity for students. Once I connect them to the right people and they get their, their opportunity going, um, they uh, really don't need much more than just be introduced to them uh, for protocols and set up to what they're doing and uh, told what to measure and what uh, specimens to focus on. And as a result, this is a really, really great thing because once we get started and they're all set, I don't have to be there for the rest of their work. They can keep going anytime they like and they all live nearby and can drive there on their own and make arrangements on their own to come in and go collect data. Uh, this is Christina Raymond. She's now married and has kids, uh, but she was one of my students at Occidental in class of 08. And this is one of two aisles out in the distance there. It goes the length of an American football field, which is roughly the length of a soccer pitch as well. Uh, football pitch for you guys, sorry. Uh, and this is, you know, at least uh, 300, 400 yards deep. It goes off in the darkness there. And there are racks and racks and racks on both sides as you go down this aisle of bones. And to minimize weight and expense, the bones are in these big, very durable plastic trays on these big steel racks. And then they roll down plastic sheeting in front of the ones that aren't being used so the dust doesn't collect. It's a beautiful system. This is one of two aisles on one side of that structure. This aisle happens to have most of the prey animals. The other aisle has most of the predators. Uh, it just goes forever. You just go on and on and on. And this is an old laptop I used to have. But anyway, you bring your laptop where you're working or bring the tray out to a table and uh, work on the table. You collect data very fast this way, especially if you bring a friend along to do your data collection and you just do all the measuring. Uh, at the moment, uh, there's more than 18 students now who've worked with me, uh, Occidental, Caltech, Cal Poly, places I've taught and done publications from this research. Uh, to say something about the climate change of the issue, um, this is ranging from late Pleistocene, right around 40K right here. We're entering into the last part of the previous glacial. And then the end of the last glacial is right down here at about 18 to 20K. Uh, and so the stage before is usually called oxygen ice. So stage three, the glacial, the last glacial maximum LGM is this uh, spot around 20K. So we're looking for the most cold period and, and dry period in Southern California will be around 20 to 18K. Then the glacial interglacial transition, GIT, from 18K to about 10K, and then the Holocene. And people have done various things with uh, precipitation history. So here's the last glacial interval here at 20K when it's a little bit drier. Uh, and that is typical of these uh, climates in North America in general. Um, and we can especially look at the vegetational history. This gives us the best window of what's happened. And we can do this. Uh, turns out now there are you know, plant fossils in some of the pits at La Brea, but the best record actually comes from deep sea cores offshore in the California borderland in the uh, deep, uh, deep sea offshore, where Linda Hoyser for years has worked with pollen that shows up in the deep sea, is blown off from the land and shows up in deep sea cores. So they're very precisely correlated with uh, deep sea plankton and they uh, give a detailed record. And so she tells us that 37,000 years ago was not too different from now, an oak woodland type of thing, sort of a, a drier or wetter chaparral. The peak glacial, however, it was snow and pine trees down in Hollywood. Right, uh, not a, we have them on our mountains up at seven thousand feet, but we don't have them very often down here, except artificially grown. And so it was very different. It was snowy. It was cold. It was pine forest, uh, pinyon juniper, and even ponderosa pines, which is what we have in this part of the world. Uh, and uh, it's quite a bit of snow by twenty k. And then the glacial interglacial transition that sort of fades out. And today we have a what's called a coastal sage shrub chaparral, which means we get less than uh, uh, ten uh, uh, twenty five centimeters of rain most years. Okay, we're a desert climate most years, and get all of our rain in a couple of months during the winter, and then the rest of the year it's total drought. Okay, so let me quickly run through the cast of characters and some of the evidence I'll talk about. Um, 
The, uh, so the herbivorous mammals will come first here, and this is the largest of the three ground sloths, Paramolin and Holonai. Um, it, uh, it's a big ground sloth, not as big as the giant uh, megatherium you have on display in London that comes from South America. Uh, and it's reasonably abundant. And what we'll do in all these plots, you'll see it goes from 40K down the lower left to modern on the right. And uh, plot some dimension, it's shown usually in the caption of the, the plot. And it'll show up each individual pit uh, is one of those uh, data clusters and the appropriate age uh, based on the time scale here. And so we don't always have complete dense sampling across the whole interval, but we have quite a bit of it. And then I'll try wherever possible to show you where the peak of cooling was around 20K, 20 uh, glacial, late glacial interv uh, interval, last glacial interval, sorry. And then for you know, data sets like this, it's often really noisy. So the raw data are the individual data points. And then a larger symbol, in this case, a rectangular square tells you where the mean is. So really all you need to do is track the mean with your eye across the slide. And you can see that for, you know, there's a wobble around the mean, but there isn't any net change in this over time. Okay, and so this is what we're going to see over and over again in all these animals we're going to look at. Um, and so let's move on. Uh, here's a, one of the largest predators and the second most common animal in the tar pits, Smilodon fatalis, uh, the state, California, state fossil of California. Uh, it's the only one that had been previously studied in the, some kind of context to look at their changes from pit to pit. Back in 1947, Bill Menard, who some of you may know was famous in microplankton later in his career, and one of the pioneers in doing uh, form and uh, uh, coiling ratios. But back then, he was actually working on some tar pits. And before they had radiocarbon, they had no idea which pit was older, which, which was younger. And so this is a plot he published in 1947. And he argued that you could see change through time in Smilodon in the various toe bones. So the MZs are metacarpals out of the hands, MTs are metatarsals out of the foot. And argued that this was the sequence of the pits there because there's a net change of time. Uh, it turns out it doesn't work that way. The rate of carbon didn't match. And then here's the actual data. Uh, this is just one of many measurements we made. This is the metacarpal three or the middle hand bone. Uh, and the data density is amazing. And as you can see, uh, maybe there's a slight trend towards slightly larger, but it turns out not to be statistically significant. OK, and we ran when you have data sets this large, you really run it in analysis of variance ANOVA. And there none of these samples stands out from the rest of the pooled meanings. So there's nothing that separates any of these samples from any other. Uh, if they're smaller samples, we had to use crystal wallace tests because they're often not uh, parametric. Uh, but we do basically the same idea. Uh, this, uh, the largest predator there, this cat at least, is the so-called American lion, or some people think it's a jaguar, Panthera atrox. Uh, the set diagram here shows you how much bigger it is than a modern African lion. Not as common as saber tooth, but the same basic trend. Uh, and then on uh, back to prey animals here, here's bison antiquus, the large bison, which as you see on the bottom right here, quite a bit larger than the American bison that's still around today. And same story. This is the ankle bones of stragoli, no real size change over time. Uh, and then this is our common horse there, Equus oxidantalis, whose taxonomic validity is still being discussed. But anyway, we have quite a few horse bones here, no change through time. And then camels uh, originally evolved in North America and didn't escape North America until the uh, late Pliocene, actually, when they reached Eurasia. And then in the late, uh, late excuse me, late Miocene, Eurasia, and late Pliocene, they reached South America to become Yamas and Vicuñas and Wanakos and, and the rest. Um, but we have camelops, which is actually a Lamine camel, and we have no change through time. Um, now, the dire wolf, by far the most common fossil in the tar pits, this is Enocyan dirus, the common wolf. And so we have a huge data sample. As you see, the data density is amazing for the pits we have here, you know, hundreds of specimens per pit in this case. But statistically speaking, none of these, these sample means are significantly different from any other in the entire collection. Now, let's switch to birds. Uh, this is one that we started with first, my co-author at Val Cyberson, who's now postdocing at, uh, at Cal UC Davis, uh, worked this as her Caltech project. And she not only did this analysis, but also established that the Ice Age species of our condor, Gymnogyps amplus, is the Ice Age species. Gymnogyps californicus is the living California condor, which is nearly extinction right now. And so she did a detailed study, and although there's a lot of noise in these data, uh, again, no significant difference in time between these means. And then over here on the right, you might notice here's the modern California condor, which is significantly different from any found in the ice ages. So that's why they're still separate species. 
And she had a quite a large data sample. This has been done with ANOVA. Uh, fourth most common bird there is a bald eagle, our national bird. No change through time. Uh, and then another common bird, which is common in the New World, mostly in Central America and South America, the caracara. No change through time. Now, the second most common bird is the only one that's not a predator or scavenger. Again, just like I mentioned before, the common mammals are mostly predators and scavengers and attacked, uh, attracted by a predator to a death trap with a prey item that's baited in it. And the same may basically work for the birds, too. One stuck rabbit or whatever, or one stuck turkey would bring all sorts of different eagles and hawks and owls and other raptors. And we only get one common non-predatory bird. And that's our extinct species of turkey here in California, Meligris californica. So it's a very large sample. Uh, nonetheless, it's completely static through time. Now you notice that the sample is highly bimodal and the means fall between the two modes. That's because there's a big uh, sexual dimorphism between tom turkeys and hen turkeys. So you have to do uh, crystal walls because this is not normally distributed. Uh, and then one of my students, Mina Madan, who is now here in California again, but she got her master's at Bristol, uh, came out to UK to get her master's. She studied the owls, all four common owls there. Here's the great horned owl, our largest owl we have living in North America today. Uh, again, variety of different things. We did not just uh, size, but we also did things like robustness, where we would take a ratio of length to circumference of the limb to get a sense of whether they're getting more robust. Of course, remember if some of you know, Allen's rule predicts that the limbs should get shorter and stumpier if the climate's colder and uh, longer and narrower like if it's warmer. And of course, uh, Bergman's rule predicts they should get uh, larger body sizes during cold times. Neither of those things happen here, okay? There's no change of any kind that we can detect either size or robustness. Uh, there's a second owl, the barn owl, which is common in this country. Uh, again, there's Mina's plot, no change of time, except the modern species is quite a bit larger than the extinct species. Uh, and then the long-eared owl, Asio otis, no change through time. And then the tiniest owl, the little tiny uh, burrowing owls, and Athene cunicularia, no change through time. Uh, the largest bird, not as common as the others, but the largest bird is, is one that is now extinct, the pteratorns. Uh, and the Teratornis uh, sample size is a little bit better, uh, but same thing, no change of time that we can detect statistically. Uh, going down the list, again, vultures and condors are very common. Here's the black vulture. Uh, this is a Ice Age American species, Corrigips occidentalis, no change of time. And there's the modern species right there at the end, just for reference. Uh, they have a, re a relative of the modern Egyptian vulture, Instead of uh, uh, frontops, it's neofrontops. And this is the one from La Brea. And here's the modern Egyptian vulture, just slightly smaller than the Ice Age one. Uh, other birds, this is the black hawk, uh, Bidio gallus fragilis, no change through time. Uh, the red tailed hawk is one of the most common hawks we have here in North America, Bidio jamaicensis, no change through time. And there's the modern species, the same in size, basically. Uh, Ferruginous hawk, Bidio regalis, no change through time. Uh, Swainson's hawk, I have hawks like crazy here, and there's the three most common ones. Each one of these, by the way, was a different student's project, and they've all published these, they individually published each of these separately. So quick then run through just most of our data, but that was just one plot for animal. We have multiple plots for animal and mountains amounts of data I won't try to bore you with. Um, going back to what we started with, which was even these smaller birds are showing no change through time. In fact, the model that we were just talking about at the beginning of how evolution should occur was a Galapagos finch, which is a fairly small bird, which does change on a yearly basis or a decadal basis whenever climate changes. So maybe we need to be looking for smaller birds, uh, maybe big birds like hawks and eagles, uh, they range over the whole continent. They aren't that sensitive to local climate. So maybe they're not gonna show change in size when it happens. But some birds are small and they don't have very large territorial ranges. They are definitely sensitive to climate. So let's say, let's focus on whether they are, uh, body size is the difference. And so my student put this cartoon here, uh, birds eating McDonald's french fries getting really large in body size. Uh, this is a study that my student Catherine Wong did for her thesis. She picked the three smallest birds they have there, which have large enough samples to do this kind of study. And that's the raven, which, of course, is found all around the northern hemisphere. No change to size, except the modern raven is quite a bit bigger than the Ice Age raven. Uh, the magpies, again, a common bird in many parts of the world. Uh, no change to time. And there's the modern species, eventually the same size. Uh, and then the smallest bird of all, American meadowlark. 
which is pinch size or just a little larger. So here we go. This is the closest we have to a sample that matches the Galapagos finch. And it does not change over the Pleistocene. There's a slightly larger modern population, but not anything you should notice, not significant. So even body size doesn't explain this, okay? Even small animals like uh, metal arcs, which uh, do have a very small ranges, don't go very far outside of where the male metal arc can call and be heard, they still don't change with climate. All right, so all the common species of mammals, we have enough data for seven of them in total. And at the moment, 28 birds show complete stasis over the last 37,000 years. Okay, right up to about 7,000 years in which is Holocene. Um, and the only difference we see, the only statistically separated samples you see when we compare them is the Pleistocene samples are all the same, no matter whether you use Anova or Crisco Wallace. But often, as you saw, the modern species tend to be either larger or smaller in many cases. And that's another story, but not relevant to what we're talking about here. Um, if you talk about the big animals, which have large ranges over much of North America, you say, oh, well, they're ecological generalists. Uh, they can live in many habitats. They don't get smaller or larger, although many of them follow Bergman's rule. They have moderate body sizes when they live up in the polar regions than they have in the tropics. Many of the animals we have in the sample show that, and yet they don't show size change when it gets cold here, when we have snow here. Uh, but again, back to the last example I gave you, the smallest birds we have, like meadowlarks, which have narrow ranges and their habitats don't spread over large areas. And still, they are not responding to climate change as the model predicts. Um, and so what does this mean? Thinking about this now as paleontologists and also thinking back to the way neontologists view evolution, uh, the stuff that happens in the Galapagos is interesting and it's fun to look at but it may not amount to much in the long run. It may not be a fundamental cause of speciation. I mean, when those climate changes happen and certain finches on certain islands get thicker beaks because they have to uh, survive a drought and live off tougher seeds, well, the size change goes back again after the normal conditions return. They don't have a net change that ends up producing a new species most of the time. It must be that a lot of this is just noise. It fluctuates around the mean and it fluctuates maybe possibly with climate change, but it doesn't end up staying permanently, okay? And in the paper that we discovered when we were writing our summary paper by Uyeda et al. 2011, this is the general pattern of all the records that have been looked at so far. Uh, there's a lot of data in paleontology that shows small fluctuation around a mean on short time scales, and we have that kind of resolution, but they don't add up to net change of speciation except for rare instances on geologic timescales. In other words, what we're looking at is really different from what people came to expect. Okay, so we have this paradox. When we look at scales of tens of thousands of years, we see stasis, okay? All the Libre animals show stasis. All these Pleistocene animals we've seen in the past, going back to Hugh Falconer in the 1850s, show stasis in Ice Age mammals in spite of the fact climate is changing quite a bit. Um, Yet you'll see papers, I'll just show you an example here, one of mine, where we plot climate changes and we plot things like origination rates, extinction rates, and there is sometimes quite a striking response in number of species and total diversity and number of extinctions per time interval. And we say, oh, well, climate is causing these extinctions or climate is causing this diversity to change. But remember what we're dealing with when we deal with a study like this, and this is my work, but many other people have done this as well, we're averaging bins of two to three million years in duration. So you're not gonna see stuff on a 10,000 or a thousand year time scale here. We've already averaged two to three million years of fossils into this sample, which means we can't see anything that fine scale. And yes, on this scale, we're seeing change, but it's change of total number of species. It's not change in individual species size or shape, totally different thing. Okay, so yes, maybe mammals do track climate on a very coarse resolution. And of course, this is something Steve Stanley came up with in 1975 and has been bandied about ever since then, which is when you think about species hierarchically, some of you might remember these debates, hierarchical thinking, uh, what used to be called species selection is now called species sorting. Species themselves are treated as discrete units and species have their own properties, right? Species don't die, species go extinct, species aren't born, species uh, are, are, are speciated, right? And so this is species sorting going on, okay? Not the direct result of microscale evolution. It's a large scale thing of taxa appearing and disappearing. That is the only place you see climate uh, reflecting things, but it's not on the scale that we see at places like La Brea. 
Uh, so the diversity curves then show response to climate change are very coarse in resolution. Each unit is treated as a discrete unit that spans two or three million years. But when you look at a fine scale thing where you can look at actual individual samples on a thousand year or hundred year time scale in some cases, you see non-response to climate change. So there's why we're looking at here. It's a different hierarchical level that's going on here. So that partly explains why we say, oh, well, mammals respond to climate, but not on the scale as we see at La Brea. Uh, but does not explain why La Brea doesn't match what neontologists expect? That I think is still a really good question that hasn't gotten a simple answer at this moment. So I hope I didn't run too long here. I know you wanted like 30, 40 minutes. I hit 40 minutes exactly. Uh, I don't know if I can do questions, but I'll check my chat here and you guys have take over the meeting. I can close my PowerPoint at least. So, and then I'll close my, I'll still have control. Let me switch myself out of this. Uh, hang well, on here. Many thanks indeed, Donald. Um, our secretary, Alan Spence has managed to um, operate some ma uh, magic and I finally got into Zoom. So it's Nice to oh, see you. Okay. I, I, I heard most of your talk, so thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I'm hoping there's going to be some questions. If, if you wouldn't mind just, Donald, um, closing your screen down, I'm hoping some uh, okay. questions are going to come through. Uh, hang on, chat. let me figure that out. Um, so if anyone would I like can... either to, to pop into the chat, um, actually, it, maybe we can't, as only the hosts and panelists can put in the chat. If anyone would like to like to ask a question, um, please feel free. It should be available to everyone. I've okay, great. Great, so just- uh, yeah, I'm trying to see if I have a chat link here to see any questions popping up. I don't see it at the moment. So there's, there must be very, there. I mean, these are beautiful fossils, aren't they? I mean, incredible. Oh yeah, they're beautifully preserved, a yes. lot of them, yeah. Yes. D do you have a feeling, Donald, for the, area that these tarpids are absolutely capturing, you know, the, the area of, of habitation, as it were? Um, well, we have Pleistocene records like this over the entire United States. Uh, we actually have two other tar pit areas that are pretty well uh, studied. One is up uh, in near Santa Barbara in a place called Carpinteria. And another one's up in the San Joaquin Basin up near Bakersfield and Taft. And that's uh, uh, another tar pit. So we have samples from elsewhere in Southern and Central California that have small but similar populations. So that part is very well sampled. This Brea is by far the best. We also have excellent Pleistocene records in a bunch of other places on the California, which the biggest, most recent excavation was the one that's now the ho hosted at Western Science Center out in eastern part of our Southern California area. And they have a huge number of, of specimens that are collected from an excavation for a reservoir, the Diamond Rail Reservoir. They're now all curated there. So we have really wide representation all across Southern California of the same animals. I mean, you could jump around from one collection to the other and just ask are there any geographic variation. I would tell you just by looking at them casually, there's nothing people have noticed before, that's for sure. Uh, and then, you know, these animals are known, most of them range across North, North America. So we have them in cave deposits and, and till deposits in many, many places across North America. Uh, many of these things are across the whole continent. Others are, say, Western mostly. I find myself doing a lot more Ice Age mammals than I started out doing. I started out with Mesozoic mammals. So it's uh, been interesting. Okay, I've got my chat working here. Anyone else wants to put a question in, I can read it too. Perhaps I could just sneak another question, um, Donald. Go ahead. You're the only one who really has any at the moment. <laughs> the, um, you, you mentioned these different pits with various ages, but presumably each one is a slightly t differently time averaged succession. I mean, do you have any any feeling for the differences in time averaging of each of those pits? So yeah, they, they vary a lot. Some of them have really tight constraints on every radiocarbon specimen out of them that's been dated. So they they average basically only a thousand years of that's just the error bar in radiocarbon, presuming that the time averaging spans that. I mean, they don't we don't do dozens of specimens per pit anymore, but we have radiocarbon for a lot of specimens now. Um, and then others, as I mentioned, some are real problematic. Like pit 16's got everything from late Pleistocene all the way to early Pleistocene. There's probably, you know, some of these are, they're basically like chimneys of, of asphalt coming up from below. And some of them have had very short time spans where they were at the surface temporarily trapping animals and then stopped producing tar. And others apparently have been going all the time. And of course, they're still active now. 
Uh, you still see tar on the surface at pit three and four, which are two of the best pits we have. Uh, there's still tar seeping up at the bottom of pit 91, which the deep excavation is really 12 meters down now. Uh, they have a corner where they have a sump pump to get all the pit tar and one, tar and water out of it so they can work in the drier conditions. So they range uh, all over. Some are very well constrained, some are not. And then, as I mentioned, my co-author and I are looking at all the new dates that come out. We're going to try a new method of trying to date these things. And so it'll change a bit of what we just saw there, but the, you know, it doesn't really matter. You could take all those samples I showed you from the different pits. And if you didn't know they're aged all and just scrambled around using the analysis of variance, all you're doing is saying, is any one sample different from the pooled mean? And so it doesn't matter whether there's an age sequence or not, if you're doing it that way. And then the answer is every time you use ANOVA where you have samples big enough to use a, 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 a method like that, that's a parametric, um, there's no problem. They do not differ from the mean. So it does, the age isn't really relevant in that case. Anyone else? Is anyone else able to answer? I don't know. I mean, it's going to be different when I come to the UK in May and I'll have a real live audience again. <laughs> I miss those. Absolutely. I teach all my classes online now, so I never see students anymore. Yes, we do have a question here. Um, okay, I don't see it on my chat, but go ahead. Yes, I'll just read it to you, Donald. This is from Mike Sims. Um, he said that Russell Cope, uh, Coop sorry, um, showed that mo most beetle species in North Europe show no detectable morphological yes. change. Yes. Over many glacial interglacial cycling cycles, right. spanning hundreds of uh, um, years, even where um, sorry, hundreds of thousands of years, even where the climate change was rapid over decades and extreme, yep. this shows yep. how prevalent stasis is. So, so what he is asking is, what does trigger change? Uh, that's a good question. I, I'm aware of Coop's study. I actually cited it in some of the earlier papers on this because that was a classic example. Uh, so insects are just like mammals and birds, right? They're, they're like most metazoans, right? They basically don't change respond to climate. So I would say the answer is the same as before. We don't know. Um, animals do, to do track environmental changes by moving. And, but that doesn't usually translate to morphologic changes unless if they've been in an area for a very long time and then you'll get a Bergman's rule effect of smaller body size in the tropics and big body size of the pole. Now, something we were expecting to see in these animals that doesn't happen. Uh, and the bison, for example, you know, we have a different species of bison in Alberta and Canada because it's quite a bigger body size. It's bison Athabasca. Uh, and there were bigger bison, of course, in the ice ages, but uh, over latitudinal differences, there's no size change. And that's the surprising thing. Uh, a lot of these other animals also have you know, significant you know, geographic clines, and there, there's a lot of it is clinal analysis, and yet there's not showing up over a chronocline, which is surprising. So, the, But the real thing is, we, the stasis is really, I think, an unexplained mystery still, 51 years after Niles and Eldridge and Stephen Gould published that paper. So. Okay, another thank question. you very much, Donald. I'm just waiting to see if any more... Yeah, my chat's not uh, giving me anything at the moment. They must be talking on different chat, but I'm on the webinar chat, so. Yeah, yeah. it's um, it's popping up in the Q&A. Um, I don't think there are any more questions. I know it's very early for you, and it's... It's, uh, it's now I 10 think... in the morning, so, yeah, but I got... Oh, it's really not too early. early. It's not too early. That's okay. But... I will be on your time zone in May, so, because I'll be there right. in person. Well, we very much look forward to, to hosting you in May, Donald, and thank you very much indeed for being our exceptional lecturer in 2022. Um, Thank you 24. very much for inviting me, and I'm going to enjoy this. I hope people had food for thought here, and I guess uh, hopefully life, life, live audiences in May will have a little more ability to give me hard questions. So, I'm sure. I'm sure you'll get some hard questions. But uh, thank you very much indeed, and thank you. Thank you. And everyone, I'm very sorry for the technical hitches. Both myself and Donald had – there was obviously some uh, – some gremlin in Zoom today, but thank you all very, very much for, for staying with us and for joining the AGM and and many, many um, congratulations again to our um, all our award and medal winners and uh, the, the and Donald. So many, many thanks indeed. And uh, oh, I think I just seen. Oh yes, um, thank you, Rachel, for that. Um, thank you all. It's getting late in the UK. It's not too early for Donald, but I think we'll. We'll sign off at that point. So I'm just ch checking this things in the, uh, there we go. Um, Sven Bulo says, many thanks indeed, Donald, for an intriguing talk. So thank you all very much and look forward to seeing you all in 2024. All right. Have a great new year, everyone. Great holidays. Bye-bye.